Anime is currently undergoing a visual revolution that just so happens to be mirroring some of the biggest problems with the gaming industry, and um, I think it's going to be pretty bad. As technology and really the anime industry itself has matured over the years, animation standards have also steadily evolved. Minimalistic and heavily stylized backgrounds have gradually shifted to lower fidelity but still full-blown animation. The aspect ratio jumped from a nostalgic but admittedly mildly claustrophobic 4x3 to 16x9. And even something as fundamental as the number of frames within a single episode has also gone up drastically. Take One Piece for example, spanning back to 1999, it is a sort of a time capsule of animation evolution itself. Compare the early episodes to the latest ones and you'll witness firsthand the incredible strides the industry has taken in just about every domain. Except sound. The sound effects are still from like 1999. It's very, very jarring. Oh, and speaking of, basically everything we'll be talking about today only relates to serialized TV and not theatrical releases. The economics behind movies is a whole different can of worms that we'll briefly talk about in passing, but it's not something we'll focus on today. But the point I'm getting at is that while there were definitely a few distinct jumps like the aspect ratio, the increase in complexity has mostly been gradual. With different studios, that manifested in different forms. Stylized series chose to put even more focus on the important bits, think like Mob Psycho, while others chose to increase fidelity just across the board. Putting One Piece from 2002, Death Note from 2006, One Piece from 2010, and Sword Art Online from 2012 side by side, the increase in fidelity is really not that big, despite a whole decade in between. Now put 2014 anime against 2024, and well, um, these are cherry-picked examples, but still, the difference in raw fidelity is staggering. A few years back, I made a video diving deeper into the shifting economies of the industry. Most notably, the move toward more theatrical releases, something that has aged like fine wine. Unlike with a lot of Western productions, where budget figures are thrown around almost like tools of marketing, exact figures for anime on a episode-by-episode -episode basis doesn't really exist. That said, there are still certainly some estimates as well as first-hand accounts from insiders talking about the cost-revenue breakdown in the industry. And, uh, probably like most of the anime industry is actively burning money. Like, the series itself doesn't even make back the cost. While the figures cited by different people vary quite drastically, all of them basically say the same thing. Recouping costs through broadcast, disc sales, and basic merch alone is next to impossible. Recently in 2023, the ex-president of Gainax also addressed the question of why anime faces this problem of simply not having enough money, while more and more series are being pumped out like clockwork each and every season. Essentially what it comes down to is that animation studios are just extensions of major publishing companies who use anime as A, a gambling machine just in case one series pops off to an insane degree, like think Demon Slayer and actually makes money, or more commonly, B, a very expensive advertisement that will funnel people to light novels and manga where the return on investment is both safer as well as higher. But okay, now you might ask, what does this have to do with anything? Sure, some venture capitalist turns their eyes to anime and splits a few million buckaroos among like 20 mediocre series hoping that just one hits a bingo. Who cares? Well, one, because the animators are literally having full-blown meltdowns, which, um, you know, probably not a good thing. Overworking, low pay, and unrealistic deadlines are not sustainable. Sooner or later, things will take a turn for the worst and all anime will suffer. Number two, as soon as they hit that bingo, you can expect the series to take a very hard turn into maximizing profits. We've already seen this with, big surprise, Demon Slayer's film trilogy, but this strategy is becoming more and more popular in general. As soon as an anime series breaks into the mainstream or maybe finds a totally new audience, you can bet that a theatrical release is just around the corner. Number three, when these few series manage to, like, skyrocket, a lot of money will be funneled toward them and them alone, because that return on investment eclipses everything. And by extension, said everything will also suffer even more. Imagine you're an investor and have gambled on 20 series. 19 of them were kind of like take it or leave it. Some of them lost money, some of them gained a little bit more, some more than others, but generally it wasn't anything like super special. But then the 20th one is like a, I don't know, like a demon slayer, and that tripled your money. Where are you going to put your next investment? It's probably not going to be among the 19 mediocre ones, is it? 
Which finally brings us to the single most important numero 4. This kind of winner-takes-all mindset incentivizes one thing and one thing only. You need to stand out. And how do you do that in a visual-first medium? Well, you're either going to create like the most absurd idea known to man that might get some eyes on it but is probably not going to last, or more commonly, you're going to create the most flashy trailer to wow people and have millions of people tune in just for the animation alone. Doesn't that sound a lot like cinematic trailers in video games that don't actually showcase gameplay? You know, the game in the video game? We don't even need to look at video games. Know those trailers showcasing 2D animation that is then later replaced with CG or doesn't even exist in the show? This kind of winner-takes-all mindset makes priorities shift from making art to making sellable and, more importantly, marketable art. Personally, I think it is a very dangerous trend that shifts focus from creating a finished product to just creating one singular impressive vertical slice to show off, be it an impressive episode 1 or a trailer or whatever else. As for how this has already affected and will continue to affect all of us, well, we'll leave that for a little bit later because I first want to talk about some recent examples of sudden advancements in animation across the entire industry. Our first culprit is none other than Demon Slayer, a manga that was doing decently fine before the anime adaptation, but as soon as the anime dropped, it completely broke the charts, even managing to upset the King of the Pirates himself in 2019. Now looking back at the first season, and especially episode 19, I think Demon Slayer will be seen as the catalyst of this animation arms race that we are currently in. Throughout this video, I'll be using two distinct words. One is style, the other is fidelity, but neither are inherently indicative of any sort of quality. Style, I think, is pretty self-explanatory, but fidelity refers to the details and the raw quality of visuals. Valheim has very, very low fidelity. Some might even say it is lo-fi, but it also looks incredible because of its overall style. Something like Red Dead 2 or The Last of Us has insane fidelity because that fidelity is also largely its style. The core appeal of that style is realism. Elden Ring, on the other hand, is an equally gorgeous game with a realistic style. But its fidelity is nowhere near Red Dead Redemption, but it makes up for that in overall composition. The reason why I want to make this extremely clear is because lots of people still equate fidelity to quality when that simply isn't the case. Stylized visuals are 1. completely timeless and 2. can be just as impressive. Having peach fuzz visible on your character doesn't make it good. It makes it technically impressive, of course it does, but it doesn't guarantee quality. You can have like 4K realism graphics on Minecraft, but the overall composition, it doesn't look good. You have tried blending something that is incredibly stylized with something that is incredibly high fidelity, and those things, well, they can fail. And that is where Demon Slayer found its single greatest strength. The fidelity of Demon Slayer is not impressive at all, but it made up for that in droves with style and, more importantly, incredible compositing. For a very, very simplified explanation, compositing refers to stacking multiple distinct visual effects on top of each other, a practice that is extremely common for VFX studios, but pre-Demon Slayer was quite underdeveloped in anime. Even in some of the most popular shows, compositing was always the weakest link. Take Wit's CG Colossal, for example. It looks wrong, mostly because the compositing is just not very good. The colors are off, and it just sticks out like a sore thumb. When you have something that is that visually distinct on screen, you need to layer layers and layers of stuff on top to make it blend in with the rest of the scene. When CG was used for backgrounds, though, it's perfectly fine, because all of those imperfections are already covered up with motion blur and everything else. Obviously, that is apples to oranges, but you get the idea. If you're going to be using multiple distinct elements that don't follow the same artistic principles, in this case, that being CG and 2D, you need to make them fit a unified style and composition. That is what Demon Slayer brought to the table. Two completely different elements that together make something so much greater than the sum of its parts. Suddenly, every single big show is leaned into not just like, I don't know, like glowy weapons, but glowy weapons off-putting additional elements that elevate the scene as a whole, and not just one distinct element on screen. Fires are no longer just colorization filters and flickery orange blobs. They can just be rendered on top of what is, by all accounts, pretty basic art. And I believe that is exactly why Demon Slayer dominated the markets. While every other studio was tearing itself apart by creating the greatest keyframes humanity has ever seen, UFO Table truly leveraged the tools at their disposal. And yes, I have literally no idea how you actually say their name, so I'll just keep calling them UFO Table. 
Instead of relying on CG just to enable something that would be incredibly difficult to animate, think like Horses the Colossal or even full-blown series like Berserk, UFO Table rather used it to cut back on animation itself and pour those resources into post-processing and extensive planning of said post-processing to elevate those lighter scenes. It is not budget, it is not working hard, it is just working smart. UFO Table had been doing this for many, many years already, and their work was basically best in class as is. Exceptions like Violet Evergarden did exist, but I think it's Demon Slayer that hit this critical mass that shifted the entire industry on a fundamental level. It absolutely wasn't the first or even the most impressive showcase of what compositing can do. It's simply the one that, I guess very fittingly, set the internet ablaze. Many people, including myself, are already saying that we've sacrificed the readability of animation itself because of those VFX, but that is like a whole different story. My point is that I think you can absolutely draw a very distinct line of animation pre-Demon Slayer and post-Demon Slayer that simply comes down to compositing. Our next culprit is MAPPA, and um, roll back the script real quick. The fidelity of Demon Slayer is not impressive at all, but it made up for that in droves with style, and more importantly, incredible compositing. Yeah, about that. This is capitalism, so when people figure out how to work smarter and, like, reduce the time required to re complete a certain task, well, instead of getting that time off, we just work the same amount, but, like, just make more, right? Because, well, you could now do it faster, so why not just do, like, more of it? Depressing jokes aside, MAPPA basically looked at Demon Slayer and said, good idea, we'll take some of your compositing standards and then, you know, mix it in with some of the highest fidelity animation there really is, and, well, you get screenshots like this. Yes, I know it's just a pipe, but look at the pipe. Look at the little water droplet. Look at it. It's beautiful. And then look at this. How did they make it? Look at that. Who made this? Why did they think this was a good idea? Look at this. How much time did this take? How did they make it? To put it very, very simply, I think the worst frame of MAPPA's Attack on Titan clears the worst frame of Wit's Attack on Titan ten times over for the simple reason of it just not mattering to Wit. Actually, I don't even want to say that it doesn't matter, because it does. It's cool to see beautiful backgrounds too, but it's just not the focus. Even ignoring the Colossal's compositing, you'll notice that a ton of shots in the background are excruciatingly cursed. Like, seriously, what is wrong with their necks? Why do they all look like Eren? And what in all things holy even is this? It's like, really, really bad. But just like it is totally okay that the Trost background is entirely CG, and also sort of PS2 era because it is the ODM gear sequence that is in the forefront, these random one-off frames in between also just don't matter all that much. Studio Witch was very much style over fidelity, and when they popped off, oh boy, you knew they were popping off. With MAPPA, on the other hand, every single frame will have excruciating detail, and when it doesn't, it will be very neatly covered up by extensive compositing to hide the imperfections. This is true for Vinland Saga, it's true for Chainsaw Man, and probably every other MAPPA series of late. If UFO Table's specialty is creating magical scenes through extensive compositing, then MAPPA's is leveraging that ridiculous fidelity to create a sense of grit and realness with every single one of their shows. It's hard to say where this pivot really happened, because series like Terror in Resonance or Banana Fish are much more heavily stylized, but there definitely seems to be increased focus on background art, and yeah, I'll say it again, just insane fidelity. There's a reason why the MAPPA effect and the MAPPA eyes are terms people use regularly. No, I didn't mean those MAPPA eyes, but they do kinda illustrate my point, yeah. Here, I will once again bring in that very cursed Red Dead and Elden Ring comparison again, because, um, I hate it. Both are beautiful pieces of art, one just focuses much more on realism, while the other prioritizes style. But you see, there is a problem, because where UFO Table used compositing to effectively do less quote-unquote animation and rather rely on VFX artists, MAPPA leans even more on actual hand-drawn pieces, and um, well, that has caused a meltdown or two. And with MAPPA, even more so than with Demon Slayer, the question arises of, how important even is this? The 2080 rule exists for a reason, right? If you can spend 20% of the time to get 80% of the results, flipping those proportions just to make every single background pixel perfect seems a little extreme now, doesn't it? Isn't this like beat for beat what happened to video games and why their budgets balloon to a ridiculous degree? Video games are a much, much more democratized market. Those hundreds of millions of dollars were literally outsold by a single dude. Animation, though, not so much. 
The reason we've arrived to this situation in the gaming space is because graphics are the lowest common denominator that even your grandma could understand and, well, quite literally see. A flashy trailer was the easiest way of getting recognition, but the truth is that what makes the game fun is the game, not the graphics. So do we want to repeat the same thing in anime? This is a visual medium, first and foremost, infinitely more so than with games, that much is true. But doesn't there come a degree where this level of realism just becomes silly to pursue considering just how unsustainable it is? Shouldn't the focus rather be put on how we tell these stories and finding new stories to tell? I'll let you think about that for a second and we'll return to this point. But my point is that better technology could enable this level of fidelity in the future, but we are not in the future right now. Perhaps we should seriously consider pulling back before another meltdown ensues? Well, before we return to that point, we have one final culprit. None other than Toei. <laughs> now, with Toei and One Piece specifically, things are very, very different because fact of the matter is, they can afford to do these things and try new things and basically do whatever they want. Remember how we talked about anime itself not really being profitable? Yeah, so One Piece has, and I need my list here, um, theatrical releases, so much merch that you could probably cover all of Japan in like t-shirts and bags and, and I don't even know what, they have like literally everything. Uh, musicals, video games, collaborations with everyone under the sun from like Mickey D's to like Van Shoes, I, I've seen it all. Um, a live action series that took the world by storm and uh, broke the anime curse and somehow reached people who, well, never even knew that it, uh, it was an anime to begin with. Um, they have an exclusive collaboration with Netflix to remake the entire thing, uh, which by the way is a big deal because it's a western publisher, right? Um, novels and, uh, well, basically a lot more, but we'll stop the list there. I think you see what I'm getting at. It's kind of like the Spongebob uh, of anime. It has everything, and all of these things generate value, and that is the value chain that One Piece has. Unlike anime itself, where maybe they sell Blu-rays, maybe they sell merch, all of these things create an ecosystem that essentially funnels people to more profitable areas of the IP. Most anime series just don't have this, and so One Piece can experiment with just about anything they want, because these will basically be loss leaders. Oh yeah, and like I said, this is also why you can pretty confidently say that the live-action version is not going anywhere as long as it's pulling at least decent figures. It created like an entirely new market that I don't think anyone expected. So my dad was like, hey, you watch anime, right? You know what manga is? <laughs> That was One Piece. One Piece. Yeah. One Piece. Uh, I'm enjoying. Oh. The only thing I'm sorry about is it's only eight episodes and I'm already on six. But okay, that's like a whole separate tangent. If Demon Slayer popularized compositing and MAPPA just raw fidelity, well then, what is One Piece's differentiating factor? Well, it's actually not anything super impressive. Uh, a lot of these series already had that. Um, it's just impact frames. But like, a lot of them. Like, really. A lot of them. For those unaware, impact frames are usually reserved for, well, impacts. They are super quick bursts of distinctly different and often heavily stylized frames to accentuate some sort of big moments. Most often, this was people getting punched back into the manga, or in normal people terms, the animation going black and white, which of course immediately creates this harsh contrast. Yeah, so um, about that, One Piece recently did 39, yes, 39 impact frames in two seconds. For context, most of anime is produced at 8 or 12 frames per second, and very, very rarely actually the full 24 we see in playback. 39 distinct frames across 2 seconds in a weekly anime might as well be impossible. And the same thing goes for the fluidity of One Piece's art recently. If you are as chronically online as I am, you might have seen a few Twitter people saying that this scene right here is AI. Number one, if you ever needed a reminder about how most people in these internet outrages have literally no clue what they're even talking about, well, there it is. But two, it is the perfect example of just how abnormal this is. The reason why some goofy goobers might have thought that this is AI is because generative AI and all of those ugly 60 FPS anime videos on YouTube interpolates frames which gives it that distinctly dynamic and almost shaky look. For another quick tangent, the reason why those 60 FPS videos look just weird and wrong is because interpolation doesn't create frames, it simply blends them. So let's say you have two frames and you want an extra frame in between, making that three frames. If you were animating them, you would have to just draw the frame in between, right? Well, interpolation takes those two frames, essentially copies them, and then just blends them together, and that is your in-between frame. 
If you do this like very, very heavily, you'll notice warping all throughout the video because again, it is not creating frames, it is simply blending them to create this illusion of a higher frame rate. This sequence is not an illusion, it literally just has more frames. I'd wager that an overwhelming majority of people simply are not used to seeing something like this in animation. And so, Twitter weirdos, either to just farm out impressions or just because they're Twitter weirdos, spark this whole AI thing. Ditto for this scene. And also this scene. The sheer abundance of impact frames and the creative decision to up the frame rate for certain scenes all indicate one thing. Moving away from animating purely on 2s or 3s, aka 8 or 12 frames per second, and moving towards higher frame rates across the board, and much much more regularly. And again, because One Piece is a whole time capsule in and of itself, it's not just higher frame rates, because both the Demon Slayer effect of compositing, as well as Mappa's effect of upping fidelity, are also present. As soon as you hit Wano, the compositing standards skyrocket, which, when combined with the stylized art, elevates the visuals to levels I personally never could have dreamed of. And the deeper you get into Wano, the more fidelity starts to catch up too. And before you know it, we have scenes as expressive as this basically happening regularly. To be fair though, they did so much compositing that people actually said, bro, I can't even see the screen, can you please relax? And they did, so um, I guess we're already pulling in the opposite direction too, but you get the idea. And so naturally, this begs the question of, is this, like, the next big thing? Just more frames? Like, 60 FPS animation? Very, very recently, Demon Slayer 2 started flexing with a ludicrously long slow motion sequence, and One Piece 2 has been doing a lot more dynamic slow motion shots. And the thing you must remember here is that this isn't real life where you can just get a higher frame rate with, like, a better camera and boom, you have slow motion because, wow, you have so much more frames. No. In anime, you need to create every single frame. So, again, the common denominator is just more frames. As recently as 2019, WIT 2 did a few slow motion things here and there, but all of them leveraged CG pretty heavily. Now, on the other hand, that is just hand-drawn. Just like with MAPPA and increasing fidelity, this is just more work. One Piece can afford this because, again, it's One Piece, but for every other studio, that just becomes yet another thing to juggle in this constant escalation of animation standards. So with all of those examples out of the way, I want to circle back to that question of, why does all of this matter? I mean, we're getting gorgeous animation. Isn't complaining about a good thing like the most internet thing you could do? Well, yes and no, because we might be losing our minds over all of these gorgeous scenes, but this is a double-edged sword, much of which we've already seen in the gaming industry. First of all, with rising standards comes more work, which inevitably translates to longer waiting times. Why was Attack on Titan's final season split into a frankly comedic number of parts? Well, marketing through FOMO probably, but aside from that, because the fidelity compared to absolutely everything that came before is simply not even comparable. And again, this is not an argument about which looks better or which has a better style or anything like that. This is a very simple matter of detail and fidelity. Season 4 is on another level. Same thing is happening in live action with shows like Stranger Things or House of the Dragon taking multiple years to come out. And the same thing is happening in the gaming industry with major installments of games coming out like, what, once every decade at this point? Quality will obviously increase across the board over time, and that's a very good thing. But the problem is that this increase in quality has become a pointless arms race, often focusing on things that marginally increase the quality while adding months and months of extra development time. Is it cool that we got those 39 impact frames? Absolutely! Does every anime now need to have this kind of animation to tell an incredible story? Absolutely not. But much, much more importantly, the sheer complexity of this animation will fundamentally shift how money is allocated exactly like we've seen in gaming. You know the saying of too big to fail? As in, things that are so complex or just well-defined that no matter what happens, they will still be fine. For example, One Piece has like hours and hours of filler that no one likes, but when they pop off, well, all of us are back and we all forget about that filler because it's just too big to fail. Well, with video games, there has recently been this bizarre trend of multiple titles being too big to succeed. When you have a budget of, like, I don't know, $200 million and you earn a eye-watering $150 million, you've lost money. Suddenly, you need to be setting record after record to just break even. For a long, long time, people suspected that Chainsaw Man wouldn't get a season 2, despite being one of the most anticipated and talked about series of 2022. And the reason for that, I think, is mainly fidelity. 
the series was incredibly expensive. So when the Blu-ray sales came out and were, get ready for this, not even 7% of Jujutsu Kaisen, a very big part of the interwebs, were certain that that's it, season 2, not happening. There is a whole separate argument to be had around the importance of Blu-ray sales and how that is changing, but the thing you must also remember is that in a extremely rare move, MAPPA themselves covered the entirety of the production costs for Chainsaw Man. So this wasn't even a production company investing in what is basically a huge ad for the manga or merch or whatever else. MAPPA was the one eating the cost trying to turn a profit themselves. I think this is basically the first example of a series being too big to truly succeed. According to the CEO of MAPPA, they still consider it a financial success. But at the same time, if you have to clarify that with one could say, and it didn't have the same impact as Jujutsu Kaisen, well, the writing is kinda on the wall. That's probably also a reason why the next arc is a theatrical release, by the way. It allowed them to truly capitalize on the hype in a much more tangible and immediate way. And connected to this is another financial question, and that is the riskiness of these investments the bigger they become. The whole term of AAA games originally arises from AAA in investment terms. AAA just had the safest returns on investments. Nothing about it was originally indicative of quality or scale or anything that we'd associate with now. Over the years, however, those terms have blurred and have simply become associated with scale rather than guarantees of returns. But what I'm getting at is that the bigger these investments become, the riskier they get. And the riskier they get, the more you need to guarantee its success. And how do you do that? Well, one approach is buying up a large IP and making it exclusive to your platform. Yes, I am talking about JoJo. In video games, that is exclusivity, microtransactions, and all of those kinds of monetization practices that I think most of us will know very well. But the worst part about all of this is that if the investment is not recouped, well, the whole thing could just be shut down. You know all those series that were in Netflix jail or Disney jail or whatever else and people just didn't watch them? Yeah, not good. To be fair though, Japan is very different when it comes to laying people off. But when money and Western publishers get involved, well, personally at least, I think things could change very, very quickly. This also inevitably damages the creativity in the field, as again, these investments become so big that they simply cannot fail. And so what you have is tried and tested formulas quickly flooding the markets. Insert some kind of meme about 700 isekais coming out every single season. So basically, what this does is make the big series bigger because they can justify taking those risks, while slowly eroding every single smaller studio because they simply cannot compete at scale. This then makes it even harder for them to get investment because it's going toward the studios actively turning a profit on big and safe investments. Which again, starts the whole loop all over again, making it easier to make money for big studios, harder for small studios. But the saddest part to me is that I don't think it's going to change anytime soon, and for a very simple reason too. People like it. Whenever a visually stunning series drops, clips get millions of views on Twitter alone, and because of that, it becomes a risk worth taking. This is a visual medium first and foremost. Flexing your visuals and having the best marketing is the single surefire way of getting eyes on it. But that, in and of itself, is the problem. No matter how impressive the animation is, if the series is only held up by its animation, well, that novelty will wear off very, very quickly. And that is why I think this thing will escalate and escalate until it simply becomes unsustainable. Just like video game graphics reached for photorealism only for that to very quickly lose its allure and produce flop after flop after flop, I believe we will see something very similar in the anime markets. Animation will continue to get more and more impressive. Toei, MapUp, UFO Table, Madhouse, and all the other well-established studios will continue to push up the floor, not the ceiling, the floor of what is considered good animation. Major investments will churn out 1. Only established IPs that are not guaranteed to be successes, 2. Prequels, sequels, and reboots, and 3. Extremely small-scale series in a proven formula. Eventually, however, there will be a major, major series, even bigger than Chainsaw Man, that comes out and is a financial disaster. At which point, well, I think we'll look back at 2004, 2009, 2014, and then 2019, wondering where did it all go wrong? Was it the sudden pivot to a lot of compositing? Was it the significant increase in fidelity that transcends a simple leap from 4x3 to 16x9? Was it the higher frame rates? Or maybe it was a little bit of all of those things and perhaps something else that we can't even imagine just yet. 
well, whatever the case, I guess we should enjoy this exponential curve that we are currently on while it lasts, because, um, well, I hope I'm wrong, and we see some sort of big advancement in, like, frame generation or something like that, just to make sure that we don't see these kinds of meltdowns at, like, every single studio on the regular. Unfortunately, not much has changed since my last video where we dived a bit deeper into the very depressing side of animation and the toll it takes on the people, actually making it happen. But at the same time, expectations just keep on growing. But what do you think? Am I being a party pooper for worrying about something that is clearly good? Or maybe you also think that things are getting a bit too good and it's happening a bit too fast. Some might even say unsustainable. Do you think this trend of more studios pivoting towards theatrical releases will continue and maybe we'll see like something completely different, like early screenings or something like that? We've sort of already seen that with Demon Slayer, right? I mean, these budgets are clearly increasing. It's not all budget, but there's also a budget component. So do you think that's going to continue or maybe we'll just see less anime, period? Because there's a lot coming out now, almost too much. I don't think anyone can watch all anime now. Any and all thoughts you might have, I'd love to read them. These semi-annual videos talking about the sort of state of the industry as a whole are some of my favorite to do, so maybe we'll do a few more throughout the year, and uh, maybe I'm going to start shooting them in 4K and uh, maybe even 60 FPS. Wait a minute. And that's the video. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately depending on how you look at it, the timing of this video is very very funny considering, um, well this past Sunday's One Piece episode was definitely something, I guess we could call it that. But yeah, this is a topic I've been yapping about on stream for quite some time so I'm glad to have finally gotten a main channel video out there as well. This topic is something I think will be in flux for a long long time, I mean even as I was recording this, Microsoft and Blizzard are apparently making a much much smaller team to work on smaller games. So maybe that is also something we'll be seeing in the anime industry? I mean, we sort of already saw that with One Piece's Ryuma one-off. Point being that these main productions are just getting way too expensive to be a regular thing. I mean, if you think about it, my main channel is also doing that. I have a second channel for exactly that reason. But anyway, with that, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons and YouTube members who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. And let's also give a warm welcome to the newest members of the team. Beta, Anke, Ploeg, I've got no idea how you say that. Crimson, Frey V, and Philip Noseratul, no see rattle. I've got no idea how you say that. But without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my rambling, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching. I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye.